are in Merton Township of Steele County, Minnesota. Our farm is a row crop farm, uh, mainly corn and soybeans. We have some cattle also. I started farming with my father. This would be a third generation. Where we're standing, it's a wetland restoration that was started in the fall of 2012. It consists mostly of marginal farmland at the time. It's a lot of peat ground. It would have originally been a swamp 50 years ago. It's approximately 885 acres. But I would say it's probably 80 some percent of it is low marshland. The land was originally pattern tiled. It was drained in the late 50s and it was farmed after it was drained. A lot of vegetables were grown on this. Since then, my family grew corn and soybeans on it. Like I said, it was a bit marginal because we were relying a lot on the weather. The water was a lot of our problem. The low land, the early frosts were a problem for us. We had a great opportunity to put it into the program and we took advantage of it. Noel from the NRCS, the local office, came to my father and my dad thought it was a good idea at the time. I worked with Charles Armstrong, the Armstrong brothers' father, when this project was initiated. Charles told me that he had several problems with farming in this basin. Frost was one of his concerns because it's low lying and his crops would come up and oftentimes freeze and then he would have to replant. As well as, of course, the low-lying area it was also a wet area and drainage was an issue. It was unbelievable the amount of planting that goes into this kind of a project. It ended up to be seven phases of work, including the engineering and the ecological science part of it. It was originally crop ground, um, basically a big peat bottom easement. This was done through the WRP. We secured the engineering funding, did the preliminary maps, preliminary engineering plans that Bowser created, reviewed those with the Armstrongs. They were very positive and very receptive to it, took an active role on what their concerns were out here, and we pretty much implemented that plan with the partnership of, of Bowser. And what we did was break a lot of tile, seeded the native vegetation and pretty much restored it back to its original state. I am, was actually the lead engineer on the project. So me and my staff on behalf of the partnership we have with the NRCS oversaw the actual design and construction processes that allowed this restoration to occur. In terms of scope, it is a very sizable project. Considering its location in the state, we're in the heart of the agriculture part of the state, and it's rare to find a site this large with this kind of landscape setting that a restoration of this caliber can be done. The wetland is about 800 acres in total surface area size. There's about a 1,300 acre total watershed that contributes to it. And this entire project is managed and controlled by one outlet structure. The structure itself is a steel sheet pile weir structure that we drove in the ground and it's set at a fixed elevation and it controls the entire wetland system within this project. Downstream of that structure and adjoining the edge of the project is a private open ditch system. And that ditch is about eight feet lower in elevation than the wetlands within the site. So that structure helps us take that discharge from the project and safely drop it down in through the ditch bank, through a culvert, and into that adjoining ditch. And, and it does so in, in a safe and efficient manner. And it provides tons of flood reduction through retention and detention storage as part of its design. There were seven different phases of design and construction that occurred on this project over about a six year period to get it to where it's at. Part of that is because an additional property to the north of here became part of the project as we were working through things and we had already started an implementation on the project at that time. But the addition of those acres from that other property owner really changed the scope of the restoration and the opportunities to disable and abandon more of the drainage out here and provide a much better outcome than we would have without that.
The steps to complete a project like this, at least from an engineering perspective, me and my staff did a full survey of the property. We gathered all the information about the drainage that exists, and we started preparing conceptual plans as to how the restoration could be done and the magnitude of the ditching and the tiling out here and some other issues with the township road that we're standing next to here. Trying to maintain the drainage of the surrounding infrastructure, protect some of that neighboring cropland from impacts and come up with a meaningful restoration plan that provided the results that we're seeing. It took several years of discussion, planning, as well as site investigation with the partners that were involved. When they first started this project, it was quite the change of scenery, going from cropland to scrapers and dozers all out here, digging the holes and making the ponds. It was pretty impressive to see. Weather is a huge concern because obviously this couldn't be done in wet weather. A lot of the construction was done in the winter so that a lot of the ground was frozen so that machinery could travel without getting stuck. A great deal of it was done in the winter and piled and then after the thaw it would be spread out and we tried to design it so that there would be very little maintenance in the future. There's not that many dikes on the project. It's mostly excavations and restorations of old prehistoric wetland potholes. And then we're not plagued by maintenance with muskrats, beavers, and whatnot nearly so much. The overflow structure that controls the majority of the runoff on this project controls how deep the water can get so that we don't get more water than what was planned for, or it could cause problems elsewhere. The seven design and construction phases started where we needed to do some work to maintain some of the existing drainage infrastructure that was providing drainage benefits to properties that abut and adjoin the site. And initially a lot of that work was to reroute about a mile, mile and a half of an existing drainage ditch that was serving to benefit other properties and to, to maintain those benefits. We took that ditch, instead of having it run through the site, we diverted it around the outside edge of it and we had to provide some access as part of that for the landowner to get at some of the rest of their property to the west of here. So once that got done, then we just kind of progressed from west to east as part of getting things done in a meaningful fashion. The landowner was responsible to hire the contractor to get the work done and the, and the programs reimbursed the landowner for those costs. So we wanted to make sure that whatever was put out there from a construction standpoint was something that was meaningful and manageable that they could get done. So we kind of took it in bite-sized pieces as we went. There were, I think, 45 different wetland scrapes that we did out here. We abandoned and took out of commission about 45 to 50 miles of drain tile. Towards the end of construction, we ended up filling in a really deep ditch that existed along the west side of this township road which the addition of this acres to the north of us here allowed for that to occur. And in doing so, we were able to connect the hydrology up on both sides of the road through a culvert that got put in and ultimately the outlet structure that exists on the east parcel here that, that takes all the water off of this 1,000 acre site plus the 400 acres of additional drainage area that contributes to it and releases it through that one outlet into the ditch that runs south of here. After the scrapes, after the dirt work was done. The land sat for a year or two years because they wanted to get the seeding done, get the grass all established. I believe it was mowed one last time. Then the tile were cut and the mains were filled with concrete just to try to capture all the water that seeps into it. When we plant prairie, it's important for a year or two to mow it, to keep the grass so the sunlight can get to it, and so it gets a good healthy start before it's smothered out by weeds and whatnot. And once the grass is established, it can kind of hold its own. There are 70 some species planted here and some volunteer species as well. There was approximately 15 species of grass, six or seven species of sedges, and dozens of species of flowers. We had to identify which areas were going to be seeded to a wetland prairie native mix and areas 
that would be seeded to upland prairie mix and there was some species planted for water mix in the ponds themselves. I looked at the seeding last summer during the bloom time for many of the flowers and it was incredible. Dozens and dozens of species were present. The grasses are thriving, the wildlife is thriving, and this is a standalone ecosystem on its own. It's large enough that resident wildlife is served as well as migratory. And the priority of NRCS is migratory waterfowl, but the ecosystem has to have the balance of everything we can possibly include, including resident wildlife. Some days there are up to 30 cars sitting on the road watching birds and other wildlife that live in the wetlands. So it's pretty impressive to see that many people travel from the cities or wherever they come from to look at our wildlife. We do ask them sometimes what they're looking at and we're able to look into their binoculars. Sometimes it's owls, sometimes it's cranes. A lot of geese, ducks. I think the main attraction for the people from the city to come down are the owls, the snow owls, the large swans that people that like to photograph. There's a lot of pheasants. There's a lot of coyotes. A lot of foxes, obviously deer. Yeah. There's actually some otters. You see some stuff that's maybe not as common to the area. In the winter when the ponds freeze up, sometimes you'll see muskrats. There's beavers in the ditch and there's a lot of wildlife. We see white-tailed deer, beaver, see mink, muskrats, pheasants, sandhill cranes, mallards, all kinds of different ducks out here, pintails. I've seen many songbirds and I've heard today Canada geese, sandhill cranes, swans. However, most of them now are probably on or near nest, probably at least a dozen species of ducks. In terms of the 40-acre piece up to the northwest here, predominantly that's where a lot of the upland acres within this site exist. And this 40 acres of higher ground upland that we have over here is critical from an upland nesting standpoint for all the birds and, and species we have out here. This is in the upper reaches of the Zumbro watershed. Water leaving this project area will be clean and reduces runoff to almost nothing. And these days, with the agriculture world being pretty intensely farmed, things like this are needed. This is an island of nature. We all hear a lot about wetland restorations and the benefits they provide in terms of water quality, flood control, certainly wildlife habitat. At a site like this really takes almost a thousand acres of land and restores the wetlands you're seeing here. There were, I believe, in the neighborhood of almost 45, maybe 50 miles of drain tile that existed within this thousand acre site that has been abandoned as part of this restoration. There were a couple, maybe two and a half miles of open drainage ditches that got filled in and closed off as part of it. All of that is providing the restoration of hydrology along with the establishment of vegetation out here to certainly reduce flows into the downstream drainage system heading south from here. In terms of improving water quality, I believe five or six tile lines from the upstream areas adjacent to the site that we daylighted into the project. All of that runoff from those fields as well as those tile lines are being filtered through these wetlands and all that water is getting cleaned up before it exits the site back into the downstream ditch that leaves the property. Right now this wetland acts as a big sponge for it. It filters the water coming through the land and then goes out the structure. It doesn't appear like this site has discharged at all over the structure from the snow melt this spring or any of the heavy rainfalls that we've had. All the water that you're seeing in site today is being held on this project and it has not left and discharged into the adjoining ditch or into that Sumbra River watershed downstream of here. So pretty remarkable from a flood storage standpoint what something like this can do when you're coming out of a dry fall into a wet spring and you're holding 100% of that water back. I would guess it's probably gonna take about a five inch rain to fill this thing up to the point where this thing would start flowing. 
this spring is probably as high as we've seen it since the project was done and at the same time last falls as dry as we've ever seen it so it fluctuates a lot depending on the rainfall and the weather the seeding i think was a tremendous success as was the whole project the engineers Everyone we worked with were wonderful to work with. The partnership worked very well. The landowners were good to work with. And their patience was part of it. This took a long time to do, but I, for one, really think it was well worth it. I would consider this project a success story. It's a beautiful habitat for wildlife. It's pretty to look at, and it serves its purpose. I feel we accomplished what was the goal out here, and, and that was to take the marginal cropland out of production and restore it to its natural state. I would consider this project a total success. I'm not sure what more we could ask for here. It's flood prevention, it's land treatment, it's wildlife habitat, it's recreational opportunities, all here. And it was a federal-state partnership that made this happen, which we called the RIM WRP program. The RIM is the state program which secures, uh, in this case, two perpetual conservation easements on roughly 1,000 acres of land on this site. And we did that in partnership with the Federal Natural Resources Conservation Service, who also secured a shorter duration 30-year conservation easement. So in partnership, we could pool our collective financial and technical resources together to purchase the easements and establish the conservation practices on the property. The Board of Water and Soil Resources was the main partner, along with the landowners, of course and there were contractors involved, and most all those contractors were great to work with. Those contractors were hired through the landowner. The engineering staff from the Board of Water and Soil Resources slash RIM people were wonderful to work with. And the local soil and water conservation district had a significant amount of input on what was done out here, whether it came to the seating plan or the engineering aspect of it, reviewing the plans and talking about all aspects of the project. Not to mention the Armstrongs too. They were very instrumental in what we wanted to accomplish out here. Working with the NRCS was a, a good experience. Yeah, the guys at the local office, they were very easy for us to work with. If we had a concern, they worked with that and kind of changed the plans to accommodate our wishes at the time, and it was a good experience. From my perspective, representing the state of Minnesota, our partnership with the NRCS program and with the local soil and water conservation office to allow projects like this to get done. And there are many that we have gotten done under this partnership. This exemplifies all of that. It is truly a remarkable outcome here. So I think we can all agree that these things are important and this one in particular is truly remarkable. If other landowners are interested in a project like this, they should contact the local field office to initiate the process and get details and thoroughly study the opportunities that are there. Yeah, landowners who are interested in conservation, uh, restoration programs, first stop really should be your local soil and water conservation district and NRCS local office. Have a discussion with the staff that are in there. There's federal programs, there's state programs, there's local programs that one could potentially pursue and see if one of them is the right fit. A lot of landowners are looking to do stuff like this and they're trying to find programs that kind of fit that goal for them and this certainly is one of them where they may want to retain ownership of it, and that's where conservation easements are of benefit is the landowners can be compensated by the programs to do these kind of things yet they maintain ownership compared to an outright purchase through the DNR or Fish and Wildlife Service or something like that. So there's value in it from that perspective. Everything I've seen, and I've been here a number of times since restoration is complete, I would say it's an absolute success. It holds water on a regular basis, the diversity of vegetation and hydrology complex, it's immense. The wildlife use has been tremendous every time I've been here. Everything appears to be working as intended, and I think everyone's extremely happy with the outcomes.